there's a lot of conflicting information out there about how your tenure with the Sex Pistols ended. Could you clarify for me exactly what happened? I left. I left. It, it, it became a different thing. You know, when I was in the band, I saw it. It was like the kids of the early who, you know, a band by the kids, for the kids. And then it, as soon as we got a bit of traction, Malcolm kind of wanted to keep everything in the state of flux. He was stirring it up between me and John. And it, it was becoming this kind, kind of cartoon strip thing. I was quite the saying it was like being in the monkeys when I left, not because I wanted to be in the monkeys, but it was, he was pitching it as a put together band and that just wasn't true. We formed ourselves in Malcolm's shop, but he didn't form us. And I firmly believe that we, he was very good at helping us at getting things going and nobody would have heard of us if it wasn't for him. But nobody would have heard of him if it wasn't for us. And so it was quite a symbiotic relationship there. It just became too much and I didn't think Steve and Paul had my back even though I'd written a lot of, not all the songs, but I'd come up with a lot of the riffs and the tunes and things. And it was their loss. Either back me up or that's how I walked and I walked and that was it. But I thought I had the last laugh because in 1996 when we reformed they could have asked anybody in the world to play bass and they asked me. So yeah. I think they saw the error of their ways. Mm-hmm. And what was the inspiration behind the reunion? Well, I think everything, even still, you know, everything we've all tried to do individually is always measured against the Sex Pistols. People are always clamouring for the Sex Pistols to get back together again. And it kind of overshadows what we've tr- all tried to do individually all these years. And um, we thought we might as well give it to them. Plus, earn some money out of it. You know, none, nobody really made much money out of the band. Hmm. And we did quite well. Yeah. But that was 20 odd years ago. Yeah. Was it a difficult decision for you to leave the Sex Pistols in 77? Not really, no. Mm-hmm. Okay. Might not. Might not have been the cleverest move. But there was a whole bunch of stuff going on, you know, and I've been approached by EMI before we got dumped saying that, you know, there's. We know there's a problem and we hope you sort it out. But if you don't sort it out, we'd be more than interested in anything that you come up with. And I thought, well, that's interesting. And I thought, well, if they think that, other record companies will. And me and John were like that all the time. And um, it just seemed to be more trouble than it's worth. That's quite a good expression, you know. Yeah. So I walked. But then it was turned around that I'd been sacked, but it's not true. I walked. And I've read that prior to your departure, you had already started writing some music for a potential second record. Is this true? Well, I'm always writing songs. I I had a band after that called The Rich Kids, and the first single we put out was called Rich Kids by Rich Kids. Now, whether it would end up being called Rich Kids, but John could have quite easily written some words for that, and that could have been a, a Sex Pistol song with the other guys playing on it. This is a hypothetical question, but if the Pistols were forming today with how different the business is, would you guys have approached things differently? Well, that's a good question, but I really don't know how that would manifest itself at all. Mm -hmm. See, there was a physicality to what we did. We all met because Malcolm McLaren had the coolest shop in, in, in the Western world. And because I got a job working there, and then Steve and Paul used to come to try and knit clothes, but had a band going, and I met them. And then Steve was, fancies himself as a singer, but he was like a cross between Tom Jones and Steve Ellis from Steve Ellis's Love Affair. It wasn't quite the thing. And then he learned to play the guitar good. And then John came along, and he was like the icing on the cake. But we all had to physically meet. And if he was online somehow, I don't, I don't know that would happen. But then people obviously do because they still film ba- form bands and go and do things. I do, it would, it's just different, you know. It's like comparing apples with oranges. Yeah, no, I hear you. But they're both round. <laughs> so I saw an interesting interview you did a couple of years back where you mentioned that as the Sex Pistols, you guys weren't trying to be a political band. You were just speaking your minds, so to speak. So. In your view, is it incorrect to label the Sex Pistols as a political band? 
Well, I don't think we ever went out and said vote for so-and-so and vote for so-and-so. A political bird? No, I don't think we were. We were just quite antisocial, really. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, something I've always been curious about is uh, John is Irish and, uh, you know, in the 70s... He, he's half Irish. Half Irish. Okay, he's half yeah. Irish. In the 70s, that's, you know, the Troubles were very much an issue. Did that influence your music at all, the Troubles, in any way? Yeah, I think it did. They were, they were, um... Hey, I think he influenced because John had a chip on his shoulder. You know, he's, he, I mean, he's not half Irish. I think not, both his mum and dad are Irish, but he was second generation Irish, you know, brought up in, in, in London, in England. So that must affect you somehow. He had a chip on his shoulder. And yes, the IRA was bombing. There was a real air of despondency in, in London. There was power cuts. There was... Everybody was on strike. The rubbish piled high in the streets when they come through. It was a real era of despondency. God Save the Queen was originally called No Future, and it seemed to me, and to John, I would presume, that there was no future unless we did something about it for ourselves. You know, and then when the record came out, it, somebody at the record company realised that it was the Queen's Silver Jubilee, and the song, the first line of the song was God Save the Queen. None of the words were changed. But they just changed the title of the song. Yeah. But it was originally called No Future. And that's what it seemed like. Yeah. And I've, I've heard that uh, this is, I guess, somewhat of a conspiracy. But I've heard that that song of yours was supposed to be number one in the UK charts. But that was the same week as the Jubilee. So the charts didn't allow it to happen. Is this true? Funny that. I'd left a band by then. But yeah, that's what happened. But I could have been a number one songwriter. <laughs> <laughs> If the Pistols had stayed around and you guys didn't end up breaking up, would you have evolved out of punk eventually, like into you know more poppy music? No, I think we were doomed to. Um, I think we were doomed to kind of split up when we were really. Maybe there might have been another record, but I can't see us down the line doing some sort of ballady thing, you know, like the Stones did Angie and John. Singing that, hey, MJ, oh, MJ. <laughs> <laughs> you guys should have done a cover version of that. That would have been hilarious. <laughs> well, when we reformed, I, I did. There was two uh, pretty good ideas floating around. We had to do a live album. And Steve Jones lives in LA. And where are we going to do the live album? And he said, How about doing it at Caesar's Palace? You know, because he likes. Tom Jones and all that kind of stuff. And I thought it was fantastic. Sex Pistols were live from Caesar's Palace. And we approached them and they wrote back and said, no, we do not want you and please do not ask your friends to contact us. No <laughs> way, just, really? It was like telegram from the mob kind of thing. But I thought if we were going to make a new album, we should do the last thing that anybody would think of doing. And that was a rock opera. And we could have called it Sydney, you know. That would have been quite good. That would have been amazing. I know you guys ended in 2008, the last time you guys were together. Any chance you guys might get back together at some point? I don't know. It's, it's always been last minute, last time we've done it. I don't know. I don't, know. I don't really care. I don't get up in the morning thinking about it. No worries. But I would, I would consider it if it did happen. But um, I think with a couple of us, they'd have a, a pretty good reinforcement underneath the stage. And I'm not talking about me or Paul. So I read an interesting article a little while back. Um, apparently in the 90s, uh, Joe Strummer was thinking about getting the Clash back together. But then mm -hmm. the Pistols, you guys came back first. So he decided not to bring back the Clash because he didn't want it to look like he was coming back on your coattails. Do you know if that's true at all? I don't know if that's true, but I'm friends with Mick Jones. I haven't seen him for a while. But when we had done the shows, he was saying, what's he like getting back up there? I said, quite a job, really, you know, for this reason, that and the other. And I knew he'd sort of gone and hung out with Joe a little bit, but Joe was sadly wrenched from the surf a bit before his time, so that put an end to that one. Yeah. Um, yeah what, what was um, the relationship between the Pistols and the Clash? I, I was good. Well, on the anarchy tour, I, me and McJones room to get, together. You know, everybody had to share a room, and I've shared it with Mick. So, yeah, we were sort of mates. Um, I've always tried to support my friends in their endeavours. Um, yeah, and then when I got the rich kids together, they let me use their rehearsal place for nothing, which was Andy. 
It was about a back scratching exercise. Back then, also, I remember doing a photo session with Bob Gruen in Denmark Street, which is like a Tim Pan Alley of England. Yeah, I've been there, yeah. And we, we was outside on the street, and one of the stranglers walked past and said hi. And I said hello back, and John said to me, you don't talk to them, do you? <laughs> Something I've always been very curious about is, you know, in 76, 75, right around that time when the punk scene was really starting to develop, punk wasn't really a thing prior to that so what did you guys think of yourselves as we always thought we were the sex pistols and the bands that came after us were punk do you feel yeah. that punk is an appropriate label for the pistols if you look it up in the dictionary what it means no because it's it's not the most pleasant term in the world mm. it was a, the prison of punk is somebody receives and and doesn't give out, if you see what I mean. How did you feel about the commercialization of punk, in a sense? Um, I don't know. I mean, we deliberately signed to AMI Records because we wanted as much... If you write a song, you want as many people to hear it as possible. And when you record it, you want to record it as best as you possibly can. And when it finally comes out, you want it to be promoted as best as you possibly can. So... If everybody hears it and likes it, that's great. And if everybody hears it and don't like it, that's fair enough. But if nobody's heard about it, it's a real piss-off. So you want a whole team behind you. So I don't think the commercial thing is wrong. You know, having been in the Sex Pistols, one of the most iconic bands in history, you've co-written songs that will always be cherished and remembered. So what inspires you to keep making new music after all these years? Well... <laughs> It's work. It's work. It's, um, I, I'm fortunate enough, I mean, not at the moment, and the rug's been pulled from under my feet a little bit because of what's going on. I should have been in America and Canada in, um, beginning of March. I was going to open up for a big show with the Dropkick Murphys. They asked me to do this in Patrick's Day show in Boston. And then I was going to do about 10 solo acoustic shows, which I do quite a lot. I was coming up to Canada, Toronto, and Montreal. And then I had some more shows around through the Midwest and the East Coast. And I was going to end up in New York and oversee the mixing of a new album that we got in the camp. I like to earn money from what I'm doing now because it makes me feel more of a man about myself. I think I still write pretty good songs. I put on a good live show. I think all my songs are the same old message, <laughs> really. <laughs> Just talk about what's on your mind, and what's on your mind is what's, it's just something hanging in there, really. That's the general thing. I think it's the same thing for most people, yeah. really. I, I think one of the best quotes I've ever read in the music business was somebody asked John Lennon if, they, if, he, if he was trying to write songs for the kids still, you know, when he, made, when he was older. And he thought about it and he said, no, I'm trying to write songs for the kids who grew up with me. And that's, I think that's what I kind of do. You know, we all have our, um, you know, the slings and arrows of outrageous fortune. And it's how you roll with it, really. And it's, you know, whether you're writing a song that you're not going to give up on some lady or some lady's giving up on you or life or the politicians or you can read between the lines on that. I like playing, you know, I like seeing what's out there. Um, and I like the immediacy of doing a solo show as well, you know, because it's, whether it's a song you wrote 40 years ago or 40 minutes ago, when people connect with it, it's a real big buzz. Yeah, so. that's very cool. You know, what do you think about um, the music industry today in terms of the internet? Like, it's completely revolutionized things. Some people say it's bad. Some people say it's great. Where do you fall along the lines? Um, it's great if you understand it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I think younger kids have a, have a real handle on it mm -hmm. because they've grown up with it. I like to not be a Luddite and try and encompass it all, but the more I know about the internet and, and you know, and viral spreading and blah, 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 yeah. the less I know. Like, I think the internet's great in that it gives you access as a musician to just have a worldwide release instantly. But yeah, my so, one. Go ahead. Yeah, but as you know, everybody around the world is watching it, 
and these days, thanks to Steve Jobs, and again, we're talking here on Skype through my older laptop, everybody is a musician, everybody's a writer, everybody's a photographer, everybody's a DJ, everybody's a filmmaker, and there's so much dross out there. Yeah. Then you got to wade through it all. Yeah, but, that's the big problem. So outside of the Sex Pistols, um, what work are you most proud of as a musician in your career? Well, the most fun thing I did... <laughs> It was done about eight or nine years ago now. My all-time favourite bands are Faces. And I played with them. I was in the band. We only did about 10 gigs. But the last gig we did, we had Lion the Fuji Festival in Japan in front of 50,000 people. And it was the band. I used to stand in front of the mirror when I was 14 and couldn't play, pretending I was in it. And I, I playing. Rod Stewart didn't do it, but it was Ronnie with Kenny Jones, Ian McLagan. And, um, yeah, that was kind of pretty cool. I like, I like doing that. I'm quite proud of what I'm doing now, actually. I'm, I'm managed to keep going. I've got great players I get to play with. On the So It Go, the So It Go, the Good To Go album, that's El Slick and Sandra and Phantom, both mates of mine. Um, the new record we've got in the can is pretty good. I think you're as good as your next record, really. Yeah. And I think what I have kind of got going for me, I think a lot of the punk, people is that we was never idiots in the first place nobody really made that much money that they can afford to go and live in an ivory tower and become divorced from reality so we all kept our feet on the ground and we've all led quite interesting lives um and we got a lot to sing about whether it's the same old shit there's a few different words describing the same old shit <laughs> <laughs> so in terms of music that you might want to make in the future is there anything that you would like to do that you haven't done yet musically? Um, yeah, do you know what? I, I, there was a shop open. I had to get something sorted out of my car and there was a shop open, a, mu a sort of second-hand music shop and they got a few double basses in there and I went and had a go on one and I can get round it and I keep promising I'm going to buy myself one because I, I make some Slim Jim and he comes over and he's always short of a stand-up bass player. And I could do that. But also I've been listening to a lot of sort of bebop jazz. And I um, thought, oh, maybe I can sit at home in lockdown practicing my scales and get a gig in the jazz band. Do you have any memorable stories from your time playing with the Faces? Oh, all right. When I was playing with the Faces, we'd done some gigs. And then we hadn't done some gigs for about 10 days. And then we had to get an early morning flight and a little late-seater seater aeroplane to fly to Denmark. And we had to meet this out about an hour's drive out of town in some little airfield and the sun was coming up and Mick Hucknall was a singer. And, um, but it was Ronnie Wood and Kenny Jones and me and Ian McGlag and Lewis, but the sun's coming up and he's a red-headed bloke and a bit pale, but as the sun's coming up, I he's got a bit of a suntan. I said, hey, Mick, you caught the sun, you've been away? And he said, yeah, he said, I went to Spain. I said, cool, what part of Spain did you go to? He said, I went to the Basque country. Have you ever been? I said, I've yeah. driven for it. But... And I said, what made you go there? And he said, well, he said, a few years back, I had a DNA test done. I said, yeah. He said, um, they found some, quite a lot of DNA, uh, Basque DNA in my blood, which is quite rare. And it is true, it's quite rare. So I thought I'd go to the Basque country. Loved it, and every chance I get, I go back there. I said, cool. He said, you should. I said, well, go to the Basque country. I've been through it. And he said, no, no, you should have a DNA test done. I said, well, why? He said, well, you should, you know, you never know what you might find out. I said, well, that's exactly what I'm worried about. And Ronnie Wood's going, what's going on here? Then? And um, he said, well, like what? I said, well, Mick, they might find out I come from Manchester. Right, Arnold's from Manchester. We're already went, what's going on here? You're all Londoners. I don't know what I'm doing in this band. Right? Like, <laughs> that was quite funny. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> Mick Hutton was a big star over there, you know, all those things. Now, of course, the Faces were not a punk band. You guys were mostly a blues rock band. So in terms of the different genres of rock and roll, punk rockers, at least in the 70s, were generally known to dislike progressive rock. What are your thoughts on progressive rock? Progressive rock. There's many schools of progressive rock. Um, and some of it was all right. Most of it was turgid nonsense. 
about six or seven years ago, I did a gig with my band. We were doing a festival, I think called Wayfest, and we played and on later on with Jeff Toll. And they opened up with Living in the Past, which I love. It's fantastic. So I went rushing down the front, and I watched them do it all the way through. It was great. And I could rush down the front because I'd just come out from backstage and I was leaning on the barrow. As soon as they finished, they went straight into Thick as a Brick, which is turgid nonsense. And I turned around and I had to pick my way through the crowd, which was about 20,000 people were going, this come out from the Sex Pistols, what's he doing? And like, what are you doing? What are you doing? <laughs> so you mentioned that you performed at the DMZ between South Korea and North Korea. What was that experience like? Well, there's a guy called Stephen Budd. There's a whole coterie of promoters and things and people to do with Glastonbury and all that. They do these sort of left, not left wing, left field kind of festivals. And it's all, you know, then some of them are like record companies and they're, they're going to discover somebody over there and maybe once in the blue moon they do. But it's kind of this hands across the sea kind of thing. And um, I said to this guy, Steve, what are you up to? And he said, oh, I might be doing this thing at, you know, in Korea. And I said, well, that sounds interesting. He said, do you want to come? And I said, yeah, I'll be interested. So they flew me over and I played with some bands. And I just wanted to go and have a look, see. I didn't know what to expect when I got there. And it was fantastic. Um, wow. Yeah. How um, close were you to the border with North Korea? Right on the, right on the border. That's insane. Wow. Uh, the, the actual, it was like a mini festival over a weekend. They did have an event on, actually on the border, but the main event was just outside the demilitarized zone. But it was funny, when you get there, there was a burnt out train that they kept as a thing, and there was a little state, I didn't play it that big. But there was some steps going up this kind of, looked like a hill. And I said, if you go up there, is that to see North Korea? And they said, well, you can see North Korea if you go up there. But because nobody lives in the DMZ zone, they can go and farm at sunrise and have to leave by sunset. There's all this wildlife there in the steppes. But to see this rare breed of ibis that thrives there because nobody lives there anymore. And this is on the on top of this big anti-tank truck that they bought. I mean, it's all... And the, the countryside is beautiful. It is really... It messes with your mind. You know, it's like... It could be a nuclear bomb any minute, and there people are looking at this rare breed of ibis. <laughs> and then that, down the road, there was a farmer's market that sells honey collected from the DMZ zone, which is really pure because there's no pollution. Yeah, that's, weird. you're right, actually. That makes sense. And not only is it a bit weird, I I went there to do that, and then I got invited back for this other sort of like Camden Rocks Festival, which where people play in different clubs in Seoul and there's like downtown Seoul area which is like the I don't know Portobello Road or what's that street in um, in uh, Toronto is it Queens something you know where all the, Queen. yeah yeah it's sort of that kind of area and I'd met this guy called Cha Cha he's like the Paul Weller of, of Korea and he played with me with these other guys first time around second time around he was doing the opening night DJ slot Right, downtown Korea, uh, a sale in South Korea. It's all quite funky, although the rest of the sales like Tokyo, you know, it's brand spanking new, but there's an old bit. And his first record he puts on it goes. So hang on, I know this. And he goes. So, hang on, what's that? Dave D, Dozy, Beaky, Mick and Titch which is like some pretty naff band from the 60s in England, in downtown Seattle. And this guy's hip enough to know who that, it was just weird. But it was fun. Hey guys, thanks for watching. If you like this video, make sure to subscribe for more because there is a lot more to come. All the videos on my channel are original. I'm the one filming, editing, and conducting all the interviews. So if you guys like what you see and you want to support, the best way to do so is honestly just to subscribe. Thanks for watching.